Hello, welcome to New Harvest Christian Fellowship, Manchester, England, and thank you for subscribing to our sermon podcast. The message you're about to hear was recorded live at one of our recent services. We pray it will be a blessing to your life, and if you'd like to get in touch with us, we'll give you our contact information at the end of the recording. Thank you once again. Enjoy the preaching. Word of God, if you're visiting with us for the first time and this is your first time in a church like this, uh, we challenge people with the Word of God. We encourage people with the Word of God. We believe that the Bible strengthens us, not just through reading it, but putting it into practice. We believe also that there's something supernatural that happens when the Word of God is preached, something different than in your devotional time, which is why we need both. We need to have devotional time that happens in the morning, in the evening, at our own homes, wherever we do that at. But also as we gather together, encouraging one another, as Hebrews 10.25 says, we preach God's word and God's presence is released and something great happens. We're believing that today, that God will do that. Today's, uh, the title of our message is Paul's Dying Declaration. (laughs) Paul's dying declaration. I know that's not the most cheerful of titles, Pastor Allen, uh, but uh, nevertheless, it's true. It's true. And let's read out of the book of 2 Timothy, chapter 4, and we'll read verse 6, 7, and 8. Paul writes and says, For I am already being poured out like a drink offering, and the time for my departure is near. I have fought the good fight, I have finished the race, I have kept the faith, and now there is in store for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award me on that day, and not only to me, but also to all who have longed for his appearing. Let's pray today. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word, your presence, and your power. We thank you for all that we get to do as Christians before you. We pray today that your word would make impact. For those who need encouragement, God, please be the encourager, God. For those uh, who need a push, a shove, a a, a challenge, Lord God, let that be the case for them as well. Meet needs today, Lord, as only you can, and we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. A dying declaration is a statement that uh, a person makes who is facing imminent death. And in some countries, uh, that is considered a a legal statement that whatever they say on their deathbed uh, has validity. It can even be used in some courts of law. And the thinking is, and then of course this can be debated, uh, but the thinking is, is that the words of a person who is on their deathbed are probably going to be more accurate or more truthful or uh, more well thought out than other words. Paul here is dispensing that sort of wisdom. He's dispensing this sort of wisdom that uh, uh, is concise and challenging. He gets right to the point here as he's uh, saying his final words. He's also, listen to this, giving us some key components to living the Christian life. And so this morning, I don't want to take a lot of time, as I say all the time, and sometimes I say that and then take a lot of time, but uh, I want to cover lots of ground this morning in a short period of time. So put off your sleepy head, some of you that have sleepy heads, put it off, uh, and uh, get into a mode of mental focus, mental focus, and then in your mind, you can tell me, proceed, sir, (laughs) with a Southern American accent. (laughs) That, that, that's the critical part. So the first thing that we see here that Paul is saying on his final words and challenging us with is these words, fight the good fight. Fight the good fight. See, I want you to know something you should already know, but I want to remind some of you that the Christian life is not some stroll through a breezy meadow on a summer's day wearing attractive and comfortable clothing. Because this is the way some people view the Christian life. I'm highly favored of God. Everything's a blessing. Everything's good. Uh, All good things are coming my way. If someone is right with God, therefore, everything's just going to be easy and breezy and light and fluffy. I want to tell you there is nothing further from the truth. 
Matter of fact, I want to quote an eminent theologian named Rocky Balboa. <laughs> Let that sink in for a second. He said, the world ain't all sunshine and rainbows. I agree with Mr. Balboa. It's a fight. It's not easy. It's sometimes not simple. Sometimes it requires stamina and endurance and the ability to say no in the face of people telling you to say yes, yes, yes. This is what it requires. Now, let me just point this out just to make this clear because you talk to a lot of Christians and sometimes they try and cover up their unwillingness to fight with all kinds of flowery words. You know, like I'm doing this or I'm seeking this, uh, searching for that. And they use all these, and really what it comes down to is they've just lost the will to fight. They're, they're just moving on because something else has, has caught their fancy. And I want to tell you today, Paul didn't look like that. He said at the end of his life, his dying declaration was, I fought the good fight. I want to tell you, that needs to be our slogan. See, I've got other things I want to say here, but I'm going to keep on. So what does it mean to fight in the Christian life? See, that's the key. We need to know what that means. We know what it means when we look at the graphic up there. We know what boxing is. We know what warfare is. We know all of those things. But when we talk about fighting in the Christian life, the the tendency and the temptation is to begin to talk about spiritual warfare and how demons and devils and all of these uh, spiritual darkness, and there's great truth in that. But I want to give you a Uh, not just teach the Bible, because see, you can teach the Bible, but I want to give you a word in season. I want to give you a word that matters right now where you're at. I pray for this all the time. Proverbs 25 verse 11 says, like apples of gold in settings of silver is a word spoken in right circumstances. That's my goal, is to speak a word to you today about fighting the good fight, not just tell you about demons and devils and all of that. So with that being said, We can look at the Christian fight in in, in a very simple alliteration, and that's sin, Satan, which includes his demonic army, and self. Those are the three that we fight, sin, Satan, and self. But I believe, and this is the word that I want to tell you today, that the biggest fight that Christians face is with their flesh. I think that's the problem. People blame the devil. It's not the devil. It's them. I think oftentimes we overlook the part we play in this Christian life. Galatians says it like this, but I say, walk by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. So there's the goal, right? To walk by the Spirit. Now, some people just use those phrases, just quote biblical words, I'm walking in the Spirit, when they're doing no such thing. They're doing no such thing. See, we can just talk about it. People talk a lot and do very little. Yeah. True? True? Isn't that true? Come on. You know it's true. He's, it says this, For the desires of the flesh are against the spirit, and the desires of the spirit are against the flesh. They are opposed to each other to keep you from doing the things you want to do, the right things you want to do. Your flesh wants to stop you from fulfilling God's will and God's purpose. For your life. This is the strategy of your flesh. This is what's going on inside of each person here today. It's an interesting word when it says that the flesh is opposed. That word opposed to the spirit is interesting. It can also be translated as adversary. So it's like your flesh is an adversary against the things of God. That's why you'd rather sleep in than get up and pray. That's why you'd rather have a lion than come to church. That's why you would rather eat than fast. This is why you'd rather uh, uh, Google things rather than listen to the preaching. Put them down. Put that phone down right now. (laughs) This is the flesh. So we need to fight the flesh. Now here's where I want to get a little bit more into this, is that how do we actually do that? And we could talk all day and many sermons on this thing, but how do we fight the flesh? Where do we start? So I want to give you something you can take home with you. I think it starts in 
in two places, the tongue, the words we speak, and mind, the thoughts we think. Those are the two areas where we battle. This is the, the, the point that we all need to see. It's not nearly easy, not nearly as easy as it sounds. It's much more difficult to be able to deal with your tongue. It's much more difficult to deal with what's going on in your thoughts. Okay, the Bible says this in the book of James chapter 3, verses 3 through 6. It says, we can make a large horse go wherever we want by means of a small bit in its mouth. And a small rudder makes a huge ship turn wherever the pilot chooses to go, even though the winds are strong. In the same way, the tongue is a small thing that makes grand speeches, but a tiny spark can set a great forest on fire. So when it's saying that, it's talking and it's likening this to the tongue, a small spark, We have massive forest fires in California. I know we have hardly no trees. That's because they're all burned. Uh, but there's forest fires every year. That, I, I remember texting Pastor Allen about five or six years ago and trying to give him a, a, a picture, I sent a picture. It didn't do justice, but I said, it's like we're, we're, we're hell. Everything's on fire here. And that all starts with just one spark sometimes. And that's what the tongue does, it says here. Look what else it says. It says, and among all the parts of the body, the tongue is a flame of fire. It is a whole world of wickedness, corrupting your entire body. It can set your whole life on fire, for it is set on fire by hell itself. This is the tongue. This is how we battle against Satan. If we can get in control of the things we say, and I'm not talking about misspeaking. We all misspeak, right? We, we say something and then we have to go back and apologize. So what I hear is people say things and they never apologize. They say things and they act like that was the right thing to say. They say things that hurt people, that hinder people, that suppress the presence of God. They do things that, that stifle their family growth. And it, it grieves me as a pastor and I can't live it for you, but I can preach about it. I can tell you about it. And this is how we fight the flesh. We do it with our minds, thinking on those things. You're in control of your mind. You know, a thought may come into your mind, but you're in control of what you do with it next. You know that. And you know, I hear some of the things people say through the years, and I'm not just picking on you when I say that. I'm just saying people in general. I've been pastoring for a long time, so I heard a lot of things about a lot of people. And one of the things that I've learned is that the things that they say are well thought out. They, that just didn't blurt out the wrong thing. You've heard me preaching, and sometimes I'll say the wrong word at the wrong time or use the, wrong, or use the word out of context. You know, you, you pick up on it. Yeah, you do. That's all you remember are the mistakes that I make, you know. But I'm not talking about those things because we all do that. And we all say things in the moment of anger sometimes. You know, we say things that we regret. We wish we wouldn't have said it. We have to apologize or we should apologize. I'm talking about when you're thinking something out and it's dead wrong. And you say something that's dead wrong. It starts from here. And this is where the flesh fights against the spirit. It's an adversary. You got it? So if we're going to have our dying declaration the same as Paul, we're going to fight the good fight of faith. We're going to put our battle armor on and war against the works of darkness. Can you say amen? Amen. The next thing he says is finish the race. You know, one of the things that's becoming more and more real to me is how very few people really understand this race we have that's called Christianity. Uh, they, they, They... rarely understand they heard it and you know you've got dozens of people here today or a dozen people maybe here today that you know you've been around Christianity a long time you know a lot of things about Christian life you talk about running the race you probably heard you know a couple dozen sermons on running the race you're you're familiar with it but yet people are not running the race let alone going to finish the race strong see they're going to finish the race by God's grace alone and that's fine. I mean, I know some of you are going, well, that's doctrine, you know, grace alone, you know, salvation alone through grace alone. Sure. But I'm talking about God t- tells us that we need to finish the race. There's things that we need to do, not to be saved, 
but we need to do to be able to run the race as God designed it to be run. Are you with me? See, when as a new Christian, I view this simply as an exhortation not to backslide. Hey, don't backslide, man. Don't backslide. And for some, that's true. Don't backslide. Don't sleep with her. Don't sleep with him. Because if you do, man, you're going to throw up your salvation. Don't, don't, don't go back to drink and drugs. Don't go back to your old way of thinking. Don't back, go back to money or self-righteousness or any of those things because those things uh, can potentially kill you. But now as I've been saved, I think uh, uh, it's not so much just an exhortation not to backslide, but it's an exhortation for people to struggle to stay in the race and on the plan that God has for their life. See, this is what we're talking about here. It's not just attending church. Anybody can do that. We have insects that attend church regularly. Uh, they're, they're here all the time listening to my message with more uh, fervency than some people sitting in chairs. The truth is, is that uh, that's not the goal is to just come to church. Some that's, they're struggling to even do that. But the reality is, is it's more than that. There's a plan for your life. Do you get it? Do you get it? Can I drive this home? <laughs> now, I know some of you, you know, you know my personality. You're going, there he goes again, kicking off, ranting this and that, you know. It's none of those things. This is passion. This is desire. This is word of God. He says, I finished the race. He didn't just say, I ran the race. He didn't just say, you know, I, I, I looked at the race from the stands. I helped others to run. And he says he ran it. There was some effort there. So here's my next step here on how to finish the race. How to finish the race. First of all, you have to recognize that it's a race and not a jog. Not a jog. You know, if we're from California and everybody in California runs, you know, not, no, that's not true. Lots of people run. Lots of people don't run. But the ones that do run, sometimes this is how they're running. It's, oh, and they got their bottles strapped to them. And, oh, you know, and they're just like, oh, yeah. And, they, you know, they're, they're, they're jogging, man. They're jogging. It, they, they have all of the outward appearances of a runner. They have all of the clothing that probably cost them a couple hundred bucks to get all that stuff. But the truth is, is they're barely breaking a sweat. And whatever sweat they have broke is because of the temperature, not because of their effort. <laughs> the trouble is, is that sometimes Christians are like that. Let's come to church. Praise the Lord. Highly favored of God, me. You know, and God is saying, look, it's more than that. So recognize that it's not just a jog. The Christian life uh, is a battle and it's a race to be run. Second thing is you need to recognize it's a marathon and not a sprint. And I know some of you have heard that from day one of your salvation. But a marathon requires a different approach than a sprint. See, a sprint is just go all out for a time. And that's what I see many Christians live. Listen to me. Bear me out for a little bit here. Is that sometimes people go all out for a time and then stop and stop. And then they go all out for a time and then they stop and then they stop. And that's the, not the Christian life. And when I say a marathon, it's not this because some people say, hey, pace yourself. Don't, no, bro, don't go too much. Don't, don't put too much into it now. It's not about pacing yourself. It's about running strong for 23.6 miles. It's about running, I think it's 26, 26, you know, I never ran a marathon, but however long a marathon is, it's about going strong for the whole time. It's about being a strong runner for the entire life. And that's the approach we should have to the Christian life. How can I be strong in this season of my life? How can I be strong as a parent? How can I run strong as a worker in the church? How can I run strong as, as I'm bombarded with all kinds of trials? How can I have stamina when I feel like just laying on the couch and quitting? This is what it is to run the race. The third thing, and probably the main thing I want you to see here, is that you need to keep your eye on the prize. 
Keep your eye. I'm sorry, I said keep you eye on the prize. Another mistake to add to your list of my foibles. (laughs) Philippians chapter 3 and verse 14 says, I press on toward the goal to win the prize for which God has called me heavenward. See, do, do you see the, the words that are being used there? I press on toward the goal. I have a goal. I'm trying to get from where I'm at to where God wants me to be. I got my eye on that prize because God has called me to this. And this isn't about some nebulous calling. Too many people are hung up on calling. I've heard it for 30 years. You know, people just, I know I sound a little bitter old man right now, don't I? I'm trying not to, but the reality is uh, people talk about a nebulous call. Call of God is to do the will of God today. Start with that. Stop, stop acting foolish. Stop acting like a sinner. Stop acting like a, a, a win. oh boy, I'm going to get in trouble for this, like a whinging crybaby sinner. You're a man of God. You're a woman of God. You've got the power of God. But that's not what he's talking about. He's talking about God's called me to run this race. And I got to keep my eye on the prize. I need to stay focused. And see, I want to tell you, this means that you live more with an eye on the future than the present. Eye on the future more than the present. Because, see, if you don't do this, what will happen is what Paul told Timothy about in 2 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 4. He says, no soldier gets entangled in civilian pursuits since his aim is to please the one who enlisted him. This is our goal. This is our desire. This is the problem that we face because we live in a world where civilians rule. Civilian, we have to go get an education, so we spend two to four years at university, so we get that education. But all of that, none of that is focusing us towards God. That's all focusing us away from God. And depending on the university and the classes you take, it might even take you far away from God. So we have to battle against that while we're at university, right? University, don't let, that, don't let your professors suck you in because they sound articulate. They've been saying the same thing for 30 years. If you say the same thing for 30 years, you sound very smart doesn't mean it's right but there's also more than that you're learning something so that you can when you get out you can begin to fulfill God's will then you get a job most of you should get a job you go and you get a job and now at your job is your boss concerned about the things of God is your boss saying hey you know what let's gather together and have a prayer meeting before work no they're not doing that of course not that's why he laughed because it's so crazy it's not even close you're battling you're battling you're fighting You're going to be involved in that. And so all of this is designed to get you off of the eyes or or the focus on the prize. The world is saying, focus on my prize. Focus on my prize. Focus on what I have to offer. I've got fame and fortune, baby. Come do it my way. There's nothing wrong with fame and fortune. Those aren't evil. But they're evil if this becomes your prize. See, that's the, that's the, the balance. And so Paul was writing here. And he was saying that we need to keep our eyes on that prize and not allow ourselves to get entangled in civilian pursuits, even though we're surrounded by civilian affairs. I don't know if I've made that clear, but hopefully I have. See, if you focus too long on present circumstances, whether you're going through difficulties and you're just focused on that, or whether you're blessed and you're like, wow, I'm blessed, God's blessed. If you focus too long on that and don't keep your eye on the prize, the world will put you in a stranglehold. And before you know it, you'll see the thing that happens in the book of Matthew, chapter 13, I think it's 5 and 6, where it says this word of God gets in there and it grows for a season, but then the thorns choke it out, the cares of this world choke it out. We have to be very careful of that, don't we? It's what the Bible says. So what do we do? What do we do? Hebrews chapter 12 and verse number 1 tells us exactly what to do. Let us strip off every weight that slows us down. Let us strip off every weight that slows us down, especially the sin that so easily trips us up. And let us run 
with endurance the race God, not us, has set before us. What weight is slowing you down? I want to point something out. You need to read clearly here. It says, strip off the weight that slows us down, especially the sin that's besetting or so easily trips us up. So it's the weight isn't necessarily sin. It's not necessarily, it's just a weight. It's just slowing us down. It could be something that you're cognizant of. You you recognize as a weight. You're going through a tough time. You're depressed and discouraged. That thing is now holding you down. You've gotten upset about something. And before you know it, you're carrying this big baby of a burden. And that happens. But sometimes it's not even perceptible to us. And that's why we need the Holy Spirit and godly influence in our life to speak to us and share with us, say, hey, bro, hey, sis, those things are slowing you down. You were once like this, and now you've become like this. And usually when they become like that, they get defensive and don't want anybody in there. I'm going to do it on my own. And before that, as that happens, now that weight that is there, I don't have a weight. I'm not, I'm not weighed down. I'm doing God's will. I'm doing exactly what the Lord wants me to do. Can't you see? I'm here. I'm in church. I'm, I'm, I'm a Christian. I, I, and before you know it, you look like a fool like I do. When I was young, I could squat lower, but <laughs> ain't going to happen today. So I want to give you one final point before I move on to my final point. Did you catch that one final point before I move on to the final point? So that means two points for those of you that are using the calculator on your phone to figure out what that is. Fighting the good fight and finishing the race require heart. It requires something that is an intangible, but is so necessary. It requires heart. You can only finish and complete and run and fight and do these things if you have heart. That means that we need to have something called wholeheartedness. That means put your full heart into it. Every one of you that is in a relationship, you're married or going to be married, you want your spouse or fiancé to have a full heart towards you. If their heart is not full, you might even complain about it because you want wholeheartedness. If you run a business and you hire somebody and you pay them a wage, you don't want them to come in and just kind of slop through the whole day. You want full-on commitment. That's what you expect. Why do we do any less in our relationship with God? Why do we pray pathetically instead of powerfully? Why is our giving just the bare minimum what's required Why is our service uh, 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 lacking? And listen, man, if you don't like all this, there's lots of places that will take you as a church member. And I say this with respect, please. But that's true because lots of people don't care about all of this. I think this is biblical. I think this is the essence of what it means to be a Christian. Personally, I think this is at the core of Christianity. If you don't, well, think about it. Make sure your argument's biblical. But we need wholeheartedness. And there was a scripture that caught my eye in my devotional reading. This very rarely happens when I'm reading devotionally and it happens to be for a message, but this one caught me here. Second Chronicles chapter 25, talking about the king, one of the good kings of Judah. I think Amaziah, I'm probably pronouncing his name wrong. But the Bible said this and it really just like, whoa, it hit me. It says in 25 verse 2, Second Chronicles 25, 2, And he did what was right in the eyes of the Lord, yet not with a whole heart. Wow. That just like stung. That just like boom. Did what was right in the eyes of the Lord, but not with a whole heart. That means we could do the right thing, but not with a full heart. 
third and final point that Paul makes in his dying declaration is keep the faith. Keep the faith. See, to to me, this is a a very interesting phrase, kept the faith, because I wouldn't normally say that amongst any other good quality. I wouldn't say, you know, I kept the love, you know. I wouldn't say I kept the faithfulness. I wouldn't use that particular word. So, I ask myself, what exactly does this mean? Something I often ask myself when I'm reading the Bible. What exactly does this mean? Sometimes it's even when people are talking to me, I'm like, what exactly do you mean by that? Because you want to know, right? You don't want to just slough off. You just don't want to go past it if you don't understand it. So here's what I do, and maybe this will be helpful for some of you who read the Bible with a little bit of intensity. When I'm searching something out, I often start with a word study. I want to know what that word means because that's the key, right? It's that word kept the faith or keep the faith that is so uh, unusual. And so in the Greek language, it means to attend to carefully. So it's not keep like I kept this away from you or I kept this locked up for a long time. It means to attend to carefully. It also means to guard, to guard. So for us as Christians, uh, This means that it's our faith, our trust, our relationship with God is something that needs attention. It needs us to pay attention to where we're at. If we're slipping away, we need to admit that and look at that. If we're not focused on the things of God in the proper manner, we need to work on that. It means that we need to not take our faith in Christ lightly. And I recognize, brothers and sisters, for the last couple of Sundays, I've been kind of preaching this deeper things, but we're going into conference where we're believing for God to do great things, not just to fill our pockets full of a lot of money. See, sometimes that's what people think the move of God is. If I got a lot of money or all my problems got taken away, I believe a move of God is when God inspires you to do great things for him. When God motivates you to serve him with all of your heart, to do things that you've never done, to take big, giant steps towards him and his will. And that's why I'm preaching this, so that when a week comes, 10 days, 9 days, man, you'll be ready. So to keep the faith means that we guard the faith. 2 Timothy chapter 4 and verse 7, the Amplified Translation says, I have fought the good and worthy and noble fight. So when you're fighting the fight, it's good, noble, and worthy. It says, I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. And then it gives clarification, firmly guarding the gospel against error. This is what we need to do is firmly guard in our hearts against error. I'm always a bit astonished at people who are so confident that they have things right They're so confident that this is what happened and this is what that means and you're like this and you've done that. When I'm thinking like, man, I am never so self-assured and I spend my whole life in the word. I spend my whole life around church and Christian things and spiritual things and sometimes I'm like, God, please let me get this right. And this is what he's saying here. He's saying, I've got to guard against error. And he did that through the course of his life. It's easy to guard against error for a small season. But the heart is deceitfully wicked, isn't it? Our minds get twisted and turned. Circumstances change. uh, Attitudes by other people. And it's easy to get to the point where you're like wondering like, wow, am I right? And, And it's easy to get off track. And once that seems so clear, now it seems so clouded. And that's what Paul was saying. Hey, I was able to keep that faith correct. The same Greek word for keep is also used in the Great Commission. This is what the interesting part. It says, go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe. That word observe in the Greek language is the exact same word when Paul says keep So he's saying here, uh, teaching them to keep all that I have commanded you. Or when, so if we reverse that, and when Paul says, keep the faith, he's saying, observe the faith, obey the faith, view it properly, and do the right thing with it. See, and that's what he's telling us here. Keep the faith, bro. 
It's not some nebulous, vague thing. It's real. It's alive. And we can do it. Paul did it. And he says, this crown is there for me. A crown of righteousness is laid up for me. And then he adds this other thing. He says, not just for me, but for all those who are looking forward to his coming, all those who have kept the word of God, all those who are, are, are faithful to the word here. That's what he's telling us here. Wonderful truths today. Dying declaration. It's not always a good measuring stick for truth. I, I get that. Some people have said some really weird things on their deathbed. People have said some pretty horrible things on their deathbed as well. But Paul's dying declaration not only rings true, but to me it's just filled with meaning as we look at it. Not only with meaning, but it's filled with challenge and with hope that, hey, there's a race and we can do it. We can fight this fight. We can make it. We can finish the race. We can do it. We can keep the faith. You don't have to worry. You don't have, I, well, I, I, I don't want I don't want you to be overly concerned with missing God, but I don't want you to be doing what the majority of Christians do, take it too lightly as well. And that's the focus here today. Can you say amen? amen. Paul's dying declaration. Let's bow our heads and our hearts. If you've been blessed or challenged by today's preaching and you'd like to get in touch with us, the easiest way is via our website at www.newharvestuk.com. You can email us at info at newharvestuk.com or look us up on Facebook or Twitter. You can call us on 0161 278 6305 or you can even write to us at 194 Chapel Street, Salford, Manchester, m 3 6 by We'd also like to extend a warm welcome for you to join us at any of our services. However you might be feeling, and whatever you might have been told, know this. God loves you, and there's a place for you in his kingdom. God bless you, we're praying for you, and once again, thank you for listening.